Okay, and Alex Lamp is a furniture designer who so designed sensibility uh, design sensibilities in form, but his extensive knowledge of manufacturing techniques, uh, respect for materials and skill as a maker. Max has been tinkering with objects and exploring the natural landscape since he was a small boy. And you will tell us how and why it's so become the first picture. And um, this is a curiosity that led uh, to a master in design products at the Royal College of Art and subsequently the foundation of this workshop based design practice. Um, the work of Max plays with both the tradition of the working landscape and the mechanism of city life. His ability to adapt and respond to different environments produces designs that are uniquely um, of their time and place. So Marx is not committed to a single material process, uh, nor, nor is he attracted to design as a means to solve problems. Rather, he explored, he, he explored, explore, explore. explores. Okay, sorry. The qualities um, inherent in the material he uses to draw out the natural tendencies and beauty. His methods of high and low tech, this is something that is really interesting on your work. And he's both designers and manufacturers collaborating with different industries as uh, the scale or complexity of the project necessities. So Max produces work for private and public commissions as well as objects for mass production and is represented by galleries in London and New York. Uh, also Max is teaching and has taught at the ECAL in uh, Lausanne and the Royal College of Art in London. Teaching there? No, I'm not teaching at the RCA anymore, but just in September this year I'm moving to California to I do one semester teaching at CCA, which is California College of Art. Ah, oh, super. It's a great place. Thank you. Okay, so, I'll give you the stage and we'll do it. Thank you. Okay, I promise I'll be really quick. <laughs> <laughs> I may not be. Uh, yeah, I'm, so, thank you. Uh, I do, I run a, a workshop-based practice. It's sort of how I've titled what I do. Uh, I do pretty much everything myself. I run a very small studio. Uh, until recently, it's been me plus one part-time assistant. And six weeks ago, they disappeared, and now it's just me. Uh, so I do everything by myself. And it's actually a really important aspect of my work, is that it is very personal, it is very intimate. And uh, I can, I, I try and work on lots of projects at the same time, but I generally fail. So then I have to force myself into this very kind of focused uh, position where I'm, I'm just working on one thing. The three words on this screen, time, place, exercise, I think that they are fundamental to the way that I work and they're fundamental questions to the way that I um, uh, generate work. They're always there in the back of my mind. Time relates to, or can relate to a very specific time, a date, a period, a moment, uh, but it can also relate to the length of time a project may take to make. Some projects may be a one-day project or a, a sort of an immediate thing, and other times they may span over seven years, as per one of the projects that I'm going to show later. Uh, place. Place for me is the context, it is the origin, maybe it's the origin of the material, maybe it's the place where I am producing the work, um, but it, it can be you know, the, the geography of a, of a location, or in some cases uh, the geology of a location, uh, and then exercise being actually what I do. Uh, Everything I do is an exercise, uh, it's, it's an experiment. The experiment is really important in what I do. It's the unknown. If I knew what I was going to do, then it wouldn't be interesting and it wouldn't be worth doing. So every, I, I always ask myself, or try and force myself to only do things where the outcome is unknown. Uh, and that's, that's where the work is. This is 2006. I was still a student at the Royal College of Art. Uh, and was very lucky enough to have a, a, a 
a small group of us, I think six students, went to Lagos in Nigeria. Uh, it was funded by the British Council. Uh, there is a British Council in, uh, in Lagos. And we were invited there for about 10 days to work with a local school called the Yaba College of Technology and also to discover the city and to see what we as wanted to be designers could do. One of our first stops was this city of steel, uh, a scrap city, a uh, scrap metal market, but it is like a city. Uh, a lot of the ships from all over the world go to Lagos to die. Uh, they get broken down and the scrap metal sold or reused uh, for other projects. Uh, parallel to that, I came across this small community of, uh, well, actually, there's lots of small communities of metal workers, st street steel workers or street metal workers, uh, and they're making pretty much anything and everything. They have a real focus on, on gates and fences, security is a really big issue in, in uh, Lagos, but then they're also making furniture for daily lives, and they're using whatever material they have uh, available to them. And you can see from this photograph that they, I mean, they just commandeered a, a, a derelict building that never quite got finished um, a building. And uh, they just work outside or, or, or inside when it's, uh, when they're having the torrential uh, downpours. And they're, they're making relatively decorative looking furniture. Uh, if you look closely, there is very poor um, uh, quality involved in, in the welding, but they're but they have very primitive means to produce this furniture. Uh, you can see there that the welding there on the street, they're not, they don't have any sense of form of safety. Um, sometimes they wear sunglasses to, or they just literally point and close their eyes as they pull the trigger of the, of the welder. Uh, and then this, which is probably one of their most essential tools, which is their bending jig. Uh, and this is what they use to make all of those little decorative details, but to transform straight bits of metal into curly bits of metal. Uh, this is the guy here making little decorative finials to go on the top of fences. And you, they're not achieving quality or, or quality of repetition. It, it's not about accuracy, it's about getting the job done. There's, a, there's sort of an expediency to what they do, which I familiarise uh, in, in my own work, uh, and try to, try to kind of extract that, that speed of, of production. So it may not be perfect, it may be a little bit wobbly, but it does the job and it actually does it very beautifully. So it's like, well, what, can I, what can I do um, with, with these people? I decided that I wanted to work with steel, being one of the main sort of, um, uh, raw materials available in the city, and I wanted to work with this simple technique for, for bending. Acknowledging the fact that bending capabilities are very quick and very um, inconsistent. So I designed a very kind of basic frame of a, of a chair, which this is a, an early iteration. I designed the chair, tried making it with the guys, and then realized that the more bends you make, the more difficult it becomes, because the, 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 the accuracy between each bend has to be paramount in order for it to, to end up joining back together again. Uh, so this was a really important uh, discovery that with their technique or, or, of bending, I would need to divide the, the chair frame into lots of little pieces, maximum two bends, and then weld all of those bends together. And with that welding process, they're very, very good at welding, uh, and with that welding, they can adjust the pieces accordingly to get the right height and the right, and the right spans between the parts. Perhaps the most critical thing for the project was the fact that up until this point, all of the furniture that I had seen them making was, uh, I, sh I should have included another image, sorry, but uh, using uh, synthetic bones, basically really bad, uh, often second-hand already, it sort of expanded, expanded upholstery bones, uh, and, and then covering it in fabric. But they weren't seams, seamstresses, they weren't doing a very good job, it wasn't upholstery, it was just a bit of bone stuck to a metal frame or stuck to a piece of plywood onto a frame and then wrapped in fabric and using staples to join it together. And in our little tour around Lagos during that time, we came across uh, another small community of basket weavers. And I asked the, the, world, the street welders whether they had joined forces with or collaborated with, with the, the basket weavers at all. And, and 
according to the, the sources there, that they hadn't, or at least the community that I was working with hadn't. So that frame became the, the, the mould, if you like, to, to hand over to the basket weavers for them to upholster. So you can see on the, the right hand side, I basically wrapped the chair in tape and said this is where I want it to be. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the cane to be uh, woven. And then they kind of very easily, and without any instruction really whatsoever, um, upholstered it upholstered it in, in cane. And that was sort of the end of the project. And the, if you like, for me, the chair isn't the point of that project. It was my outcome from a 10-day project. There were actually three other projects that I did, but I'm just showing you this one. But for me, the legacy of that project was really the introduction of those two communities to work together. Both had kind of assets that were highly valuable in fabricating and producing equipment for daily lives. Uh, and by using the basket weaving technique and that, you know, the, the beautiful cane work uh, made that piece of furniture, okay, it's still crude, uh, but it has far more sort of long-term value as a functional product than a piece of uh, shitty foam. Place, again, another kind of highly specific area. Cornwall, this is, yeah, this is where I'm from, this is me uh, on the left-hand side, and that is my dad on the right-hand side. So I actually don't know how old I was there, maybe three, four, something like that. Uh, and uh, this is me 23 years later, uh, or 24 years later. Uh, still a student at the Royal College of Art in my final year, going into actually my final three months at, at, at college, and desperately wanting to be a designer who makes products for industry, and having no funds to do that. And I think I hadn't really had that real industrial experience. I hadn't, to that point, collaborated with foundries or factories or, or uh, any real sort of industrial setting. And I had contacted a, uh, a foundry in London. They had allowed me to go and visit, and I did visit them. They're an aluminium fa uh, foundry. And uh, we started discussing uh, what I might want to do. And they said, OK, you need to send us drawings, or you need to make a mould, or we'll make, we'll use the, draw the drawings and we'll make the mould for you. And then we need a, you know, a limited, uh, or, uh, uh, a, a minimum order of you know, five units, or a minimum spend of £3,000. And I'm like, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, and so I just started thinking, I broke down that process of industrial casting into its fundamental components, which is I need molten metal, or I need metal, I need a way of heating that metal to make it molten, and I need a material that I can pour that metal into, a, a mould material. And I thought back to my history, you know, my, my, my roots, and realised that the, the beach um, was the perfect boundary, or could be the perfect boundary for me. Um, I went with very little in the way of an idea as to what I wanted to make. Uh, the, the beach, if you like, became my sketchbook. Uh, it was where I experimented with ideas. This is how my project related to that idea of exercise. It was an exercise in practicing and experimenting and testing ideas. So that first image, this, you can see I've got a bucket and a spade and, and, uh, and I'm making sandcastles and there I've got a bucket and a spade and I'm making sandcastles. And it was a very silly idea, actually. Um, so this is the, firstly, this is the this is my material. This is pewter. Uh, in terms of place, this pewter itself did, didn't come from Cornwall. But Cornwall, back in the day, until I think actually 1989, was still heavily involved in the mining of, of tin. Uh, pewter is 92% tin. Uh, and actually, next year. Um, it's been in the pipeline for the last five years, but next year one of the last mines to close will reopen again. And the only reason that the mine closed was due to um, the international crisis. And now it's much more um, financially viable to, to mine tin uh, in Cornwall again. So that was my chosen metal. Also the fact that it had very low, low melting point. Uh, this was my very first idea, make a sandcastle, cast a shape, so carve a shape into the sandcastle and pour the, the molten metal. Uh, very naive idea, didn't have any other, I'd never touched molten metal before, I mean, who has? Uh, who has, you know, learned the behavior of this material? Uh, and 
you know, I thought it'd be like pouring um, boil, boiling sugar, like liquid sugar over a, over a surface and it'll just cool down very quickly and, and solidify. Well, it doesn't. Uh, it, it has a huge amount of density and weight and it just drips straight off the mould. Um, so I went, you know, back to the drawing board, if you like, and uh, carved a new shape or multiple new shapes into the sand. And, and actually, this is day five on the beach. Uh, and you can see me, I've built up the level of the sand, because at one point I realized that I started digging down and the, and the water level was higher, so I had to start again. So I didn't make that mistake again. Uh, built up the level of the sand uh, and carved this triangular pattern into the surface. This was my workshop, or this is my foundry equipment. It was my mum's old stainless steel saucepans. Actually, they weren't old. They, <laughs> they became old very quickly. Uh, and actually, just a camping stove. A uh, pewter melts at 235 degrees centigrade. So it's very, very low melting point. You can just do it on the stove top in your kitchen uh, or on a camping stove. So it's actually a really, pewter is a really nice, accessible metal to, to, to practice the art of casting with. And you can see me here pouring the molten metal. It's still silver. Uh, a lot of metals, once it gets to the point of liquid, becomes sort of red hot. This isn't, which is quite deceiving, because it is actually very hot. Um, and you do have to be careful. Um, but the mold was essentially a three-legged stool, a triangle. Um, I pushed a rod, a metal rod, into the ground, into the sand in three points, making a triangle. And then with a the kitchen knife, I divided those three points into lots of little triangles, like little containers or little troughs. I poured the metal into the first leg, the second leg, the third leg. It filled up and filled all of those uh, troughs. Fifteen minutes later, uh, the metal is cooled down enough, it's solidified, and I start excavating the piece, revealing whether or not the casting has worked. The carving probably takes about 45 minutes. I mean, plus or, plus or minus 20 minutes, depending on what mood I'm in. Uh, but uh, it's a very kind of quick process. And in the process of excavating the piece, you demolish the mold. That opens up a lot of possibilities. This isn't about serial production. It could be about mass production. But every single one of those pieces would be entirely unique. And that's something that runs true or runs through a lot of a lot of the work that I produce in my, in my workshop. This is one of my workshops. And that's the finished piece. It was finished. I finished it on the beach. It took one hour from start to finish and I went away with the finished product. It doesn't need any finishing. It doesn't need, you don't need to cut the bottoms of the legs off. You don't need to polish it because the top surface wasn't in contact with anything other than air. And you end up with a relatively uh, polished surface already, at least a smooth surface. So it was a ready-made, finished product. This really is serial production going on to mass production. And you know, th this is an interesting situation. Stoke-on-Trent, uh, uh, famous, uh, famous in the world, if you know, but famous in the UK especially for uh, ceramic production, industrial ceramic production. Industrial Revolution, they realized that they had coal, they realized they had clay. The two things went together and they produced uh, en masse ceramics that were that fed all of the United Kingdom, Europe, and then further overseas. Until demand, perhaps, international demand exceeded their ability to produce and a lot of the production then went overseas. So now you see situations like this where the traditional bottle kilns, they're called, so this is actually a kiln. Uh, where the ceramics is fired, it's like a big chimney, and the bottom of the chimney is where all the pots go, and the, the, the smoke and the flames go up through it. Um, a lot of them, they're not used anymore. This method of firing has all been industrialized now to the point of gas and, and uh, even electricity. And these bottle kilns are either demolished or they are uh, or they're converted into luxury apartments, of course. Uh, but at least they remain part of the landscape. So that kind of industrial heritage remains visible rather than being behind closed doors. So, so I was invited by a very small startup company called 1882. Uh, this was back in 2010, I think, uh, or let's say 2010. And they didn't have their own factory. They tapped into 
uh, a lot of the small existing remaining factories that remained in Stoke on Trent. This one called Hudson Mills, and they still exist. Actually, they are producing what I designed for them now, but uh, another factory is. This is a nice sort of introduction to, to, to their product, if you like. You go in, you go into their offices, and in the entrance they have a saucer on the floor, which it, it's not put there on purpose as a demonstration, but does demonstrate the strength of the ceramic that they're producing. This is used as a doorstop. It's actually fine bone china. Uh, so it, it, incredible uh, impact strength and, uh, and and resistance to yeah, resistance to breaking. So it's a nice opening demonstration of, of the, the strength of what they do. They're, they're producing en masse very generic mugs and bowls and cups and plates, onto which de decals, customers' decals are, are, are applied or they're gilded. Uh, it's a very it's a basic shape which is then decorated to suit the customer. But there's still a lot of hand processes involved. I mean, this is what they call the sponging station. So when the pieces are come out of the mold, the process is slip casting. So when the, 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 the pieces have come out of the mold, the typically ladies um, are taking the piece and they're sponging off the parting lines, the little seams that, that demonstrate or show that the pieces come out of the mold. Uh, basically wiping away evidence of, of how it's been produced. And another you know, relatively skilled process, which is the gilding uh, process. And they have an amazing team of people. I mean, all kind of beautiful people. Uh, and, and it's really important with all of these projects that, that I do, that any designer does, that we immerse ourselves in their world. You know, we're designers, and we all generally have quite big egos. And we think that we can design really great products. But you can only really design great products if you listen to the people who are doing the making, who know their, their industry inside and out. So spending time with these people, people is a really kind of fundamental part of, of my practice. And it's always hard to, to sort of take jobs away from, from uh, these people. But I, what I decided to do for this, for this project, I was asked to design a, a range of uh, tableware, uh, cups, bowls, and plates. Um, but they wanted to start from scratch. They didn't want me to use their existing molds. They wanted something to be done from the beginning. But I'm not a ceramic designer, and, I, and I, although I um, was exposed to the process of making, uh, trans, translating a two-dimensional profile, a silhouette of a piece, which is often just half a piece because it's swept around, it's turned on a lathe by the, the mold maker or the model maker, and then that model is then transformed into a mold, and then the mold is then reproduced. I decided that that's not what I do. I like making things. I like, rather than drawing a shape, I need to make a shape. And so my beginning was actually to make solid cubes of plaster, which could be my modeling material to, to make the physical shape. Uh, and I resorted to tools that I was already quite familiar with at that time. I'd done quite a lot of stone masonry, uh, very kind of traditional hand carving of, of stone. So I had my, my chisels and, and hammers and quite literally went set to on these blocks of plaster with the hammer and chisel to make these kind of very primitive, uh, primitive by default, <laughs> uh, because I wasn't a master carver. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, I like speed, uh, I like expediency, I like spontaneity, uh, and I like to kind of just get the job done. And so I carved until I had the basic form of what resembled a jug uh, and what resembled a mug in a bowl. Um, and I refined them to a, to a degree, to the point where imagining they would be hollow, they would be functional. So that was what I then delivered. I didn't deliver a drawing, I delivered the, 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 the models, or the masters as they called them, from which molds were cast and the, the, the molds are three-part molds, uh, which are then filled with the, the liquid slip, which is the liquid clay, fine bone china. Uh, and I think this is about 40 minutes of, of drying. They, uh, they pour in the slip, they s let it sit there for 45 minutes, and then pour out the slip, uh, the uh, excess liquid, and then let it dry to the point where they can remove it from the mold. And it shrinks away from the mold so they can pull it out very easily. 
and then onto the, the, the sponging station, and that's where the kind of the, the, the conundrum uh, we were faced with. Uh, how do you sponge something that's highly textured without removing all of that detail away? And we realized that actually sponging wasn't the technique for these pieces, and instead the, the, the spongers would need to um, pick up chisels or some sharp object that they could, just a little shard of metal, that they could scrape the, the parting lines away from the, the, the casts with, uh, rather than sponging away. So, in a sense, these spongers, rather than removing all trace of their hand, um, they're sort of adding a little dimension to each of those pieces. Each piece is, they're sort of trying to blend my chisel marks together with their own chisel marks. So they become a really sort of fundamental part of the, the making of each piece. I had to have a go as well, obviously, to try and kind of <laughs> decide myself actually how to, to, when to stop, essentially. And then, these are actually the cast pieces. You can see there's very little in the way of difference between the dry, um, the unfired wear, and the fired wear. And I chose not to cast, oh, sorry, not to glaze the exterior, but only the interior. And that was a very conscious decision because I didn't want to remove that, uh, if you like, the trace of, uh, or the origin of the material. I carved these pieces from plaster. These still look like they've been carved from a block of plaster. So it really speaks of their, of the process of making. Yorkshire, a very another kind of um, uh, sentimental place for me. Uh, this is actually my grandpa's farm. Uh, he's 92 years old now, uh, still farming. He has 200 acres of uh, arable farmland, so he's growing crops. Uh, there's a big farmhouse, but this is a small cottage which he lives in, which when I was in my 20s, early 20s, together I helped him convert from a cattle shed into what is now his cottage. Uh, next to it, on the left-hand side, is a, is a very big tree, an ash tree. And that tree, you can't see from this picture, it was actually a very, very healthy tree on the face of it, but one very large branch there had snapped off in a storm maybe 20, 30 years previously. And the main trunk of the tree was rotting from the inside out. So even though everything above it was very alive, everything below it was becoming increasingly fragile, it was necessary for it to come down. My grandpa, just in passing kind of conversation, said that he was going to be cutting down this ash tree. Um, and this is where the idea of time comes into my work. Uh, two accounts. This tree was coming down there and then. It was, he was going to get a, wood, a tree surgeon to come in and, and cut the tree down. And his, he saw its function, its afterlife, as firewood. And that's a very valuable resource for, for wood. There's nothing wrong with, with, with burning, burning wood to generate heat um, and for probably survival for him for the rest of his days. <laughs> um, and, and yet, I saw another possibility with this material, but I had to act very quickly. So rather than him just cutting the tree down and, and chopping it into firewood, I said that I, would, I, I wanted to do something with it. He said, OK, you can have the tree, but you have to take it down, and I have to manage the taking down of the tree. Uh, luckily, already in my head, I, I knew I had a friend uh, called John Turnbull, who, uh, tree surgeon, uh, actually, kind of, at that point, he was three times European tree climbing champion. There is such a thing. He's like a master tree climber. Uh, and, and so I, I instructed him. I gave him, I, I sort of, what do you call it, choreographed or conducted the operation. But he, he cut the tree down in a very, very safe manner from the very top down, bit by bit by bit by bit. Um, it may be in, into about 30 pieces. Uh, there's my grandpa. Uh, as you can very clearly see there, the, uh, the one of the main parts of the trunk, you know, how, how hollow it was there. Uh, moving it away from the tree and, and onto this, onto a, onto the, another part of the farmyard, uh, and that's the very, very kind of last base part of the tree trunk. That was um, the, the wedge that was removed in order to fell the last section of the tree. So from the 30 pieces that he cut down, I then subsequently cut it into 131 pieces. 
stopping at the point where I saw little or no function in the pieces of wood. And I suppose what I mean by that is the destiny for these pieces of, or these logs were that of furniture. I wanted them to function as furniture. I wanted people to have a piece of tree, not a piece of furniture, but I wanted people to use a piece of tree as a piece of furniture in their homes. And so cut it into these pieces to the point where there was about 15 centimeters in diameter. And at that point, I gave them back to my grandpa and he had his firewood and I had my, I had my 131 pieces of wood. Over the next seven years, I, every year I went back to the farm and I rotated the pieces of wood uh, to allow them to dry out relatively ease, uh, evenly. And then in 2015, in the summer, I spent, I think it was 28 days back to back, uh, sanding and sanding and sanding, again with my dad. Uh, it's a very personal affair, my, my practice, uh, family affair. Uh, and one assistant at the time, who was a, an ex, or just graduated student from the Royal College. And uh, 28 days back to back, uh, sanding. And we branded every single piece uh, and stamped every single piece. My grandfather's tree, Moncton Walk Farm, 1822 to 2009. 2009 being the year that I cut the tree down. It was 187 years old, this tree. And then I, I created a sort of a map of the tree, branding every single piece. You can see the whole tree, um, and that is the whole piece. 131 pieces, uh, a very large three-dimensional jigsaw of the original tree. And the pieces are just logs. That's all they are. That's a very kind of clear illustration of the initial crotch, the very first split of the tree where one section is completely rotten and the other section is still very healthy. Um, there were two other crotches, very large crotches in the tree that I made chairs out of just because I'm a little bit obsessed by chairs. Um, and because they were pretty much the only two pieces that facilitated a chair. They were the two pieces that sort of wanted to be a chair. And there's the other one. And log after log after log after log. Um, and that's the whole tree. Every single piece is as important as the one next to it. Uh, because you miss one piece and then the, the, the tree is broken. Uh, I then created a formula. Uh, I decided I didn't want... Uh, what do you do with the whole tree now? Like, <laughs> what have I just done? What have I created? Uh, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to let my grandpa burn it now? Now that I've documented it? Or, or maybe I should try and sell it is what I thought. So did a big exhibition at Somerset House in central London, this was 2015, and uh, put a price on every single piece and it was calculated based on volume and volume alone. No piece was more special than the other. The same formula applied to every single piece. Uh, and starting from about, uh, I think it was about 90 pounds, up to you know, say 100 euros, Actually, it was cheaper than that. It was about yeah, 90, 95 euros, up to about 5,000 pounds for the largest piece. Uh, and we've sold probably about 40 or 50 pieces. And the rest of it's in storage. So if anybody wants a piece of tree, then... <laughs> and quite beautifully now, this, is, this photograph was taken in 2015. This is the tree. Uh, you know, we didn't kill the tree. The tree is growing again. Uh, that's me and my grandpa. Uh, and uh, it's a female. It's one of the, well, not one of the few trees, but it is interesting that, that it, there is such a thing as a female ash and a male ash, but this is a female ash, and it's still growing. Cheng Nam Zhuang Zen, which is 350 kilometers southwest of Beijing. Beijing is, I think that's Beijing. I actually don't read uh, Chinese, so, but I, I think it is. Um, and that's where I was in Cheng Nan as well. Is it going back again? It's 2011. My, not my first time to China, but my first time to China in a professional context. I was uh, invited to do an exhibition in Beijing. I was given 10 days to do a project in Beijing, which culminated in, or in China, which culminated in an exhibition in Beijing. Uh, I was asked by uh, Alexander von Begusak, who we were talking about earlier uh, with Andrea and Simone, uh, who was the 
was it the founder, founder of the Beecher Design Museum 30 years ago or more. And he was curating a small exhibition in, uh, and Christina Maria, did, uh, Maria Christina Didera as well, actually. Uh, the two of them together invited me. And I honed in on Google Satellite to Beijing, uh, looking for stone. I just decided, you know, sometimes you just have to make a decision. And I made a decision I wanted to work with stone. Uh, and I zoomed in on Google Satellite in, in Beijing and found what looked like a quarry on the outskirts of Beijing. I found, through a lot of time-consuming research, found a company who had apparently had access to this quarry, contacted the, the stone yard, booked my flight, arrived at Beijing, a representative from the stone factory picked me up, put me in a car, and then we drove for hours and hours and hours, but I didn't know where we were going, and I was by myself. I had the nephew of, this, of what was the stone yard I ended up working with, uh, who had a Nokia phone with Google, with a, with a translate function, and he was my translator for the, uh, uh, for the, the week that I spent with them. But anyway, it turns out, and I didn't know until I went back to Beijing that where I was was Cheng Nan's uh, Zen. Uh, and it was very much a very kind of rural, dry, arid part of central China. And you can see uh, in the valley there, this is a little village which is entirely stone. It's a stone village, uh, as in they, it is a stone industry. Behind me, whilst taking this photograph, is the quarry. And quite serendipitously, that's not the right word, <laughs> so quite fortunately, um, next to the quarry was this little pile of boulders which I fell in love with. This for them wasn't what they're quarrying. They're quarrying big blocks of stone. They're cutting the material out of the ground. They're cutting it into slices. They're cutting the slices into tiles. They're polishing the tiles. It then gets in floors of hotels and offices and stuff. I chose the little boulders because they already existed and they were just this kind of wonderful little kind of shape like potatoes. You didn't know what was inside them already, whereas with cut stone you already know what you're going to get, so there was this element of surprise. We're okay. Um, and picked out a little selection of boulders, they were transported down to the bottom of the village on this little three-wheeled trike. Uh, to this place, and this was quite an important project for me. All of my projects are important, but this was an important one because I think it was probably the first time that I just went into entirely unknown territory. I took myself out of my comfort zone. I sort of went to a part of the world that I'd never explored. I was not able to speak the language that they spoke. And it was also an industry that I didn't really know anything about. I had assumptions. I had done, a, like I said, I'd done a little bit of stone masonry. I'd got a, a little piece of sandstone and I'd learned how to carve. Not well, but I'd learned how to carve. But this was something else. Uh, and I was staying in a kind of like a bed and breakfast uh, in, in the nearby village. Uh, and working with these people, I had breakfast in the, in the in the bed and breakfast, but then I ate lunch and dinner with these people. And all the communication, despite me having done a little selection of drawings of the boulders that I had found and selected, with illustrations, just very kind of simple. I'm sorry, I should show you a photo, uh, a picture of the drawings, but maybe you can kind of just about see. Um, it's a little kind of three-dimensional sketch of one of the pieces saying that it needs to be cut here and cut here, but it didn't work. This method of communication didn't work. And actually, this method of communication did. And that was quite simply drawing lines on the boulders themselves. It became far more immediate. And for me, it became a really good way of visualizing what I was going to get without, I mean, it sounds sort of a little bit ridiculous, finding a, a natural lump of stone, then doing a little drawing of it, and then trying to illustrate what I want that piece of stone to become, to become, when actually if I was in full control of this process, I would move the piece of stone onto the saw, I would orientate it, and then make the cut exactly where I want it. Well, of course, I couldn't do that. I had to tell them how to do it, so by quite simply drawing lines on the stones and writing, you know, 95, approximately 95 to 105 degrees, 
agreed, you know, that's all that really mattered. It was, it was just kind of getting the point across because actually once you make the first cut, then everything else changes. So from that first cut, you then remeasure, and then um, the, the next cut can begin. Can begin. A boulder that I wanted to cut it, uh, the top and the bottom off, and then cut into four pieces. Um, another little illustration of, of um, uh, achieving the sequence of achieving the angle on, on the, the seat. So to begin with, positioning it like this. This is cut number one. Removing. I don't even know what that means. I think it means 35 centimeters from, I think I wanted the seat height to be 35 centimeters. Cut that off, then on, you know, uh, rotate the, the boulder and make the second cut. And it was hard for us, you know, these guys just work, work, work. But in a very primitive way, you know, they're doing things by hand where maybe elsewhere you, we, we would be, you know, in, in, in Europe and other parts of, of the world, we would be using um, kind of automated machinery. But you know what? It isn't because they don't have it. They do have cranes, they do have lifts. But this is quicker. It's much quicker just to do it like this than because the machine, I think there's another photograph, uh, well, you can't really see, but there, for example, this is a very kind of large scale winch, uh, but it moves at a snail's pace. So to, to use this machine is, is only necessary when the bowl has become unmanageable. So it's kind of very beautiful to see these. these men and women for that matter lifting man watching man lift these boulders by hand and getting them onto the onto the bed of the saw and manhandle them and orientate them into position therefore the simplicity of what i was doing was really important you know i had seven days or ten days from start to finish to produce a body of work that was going into an exhibition it was all again all about um, speed and uh, expediency and this is probably the most time-consuming piece, which in hindsight was a little bit of a you know, ridiculous exercise, but I wanted to use that, sort of, that the radius or the diameter of the saw blade to achieve, achieve a sort of concave surface in the, in the seat of the chair by making lots of uh, gradual plunge cuts into, into the, the surface of the stone, which took a very long time. And you can see the guys just taking a break. A lot of hand grinding, a lot of, a lot of polishing. Uh, leaving 90 or maybe 70% of all of the pieces in their natural state, not doing anything, just washing them down. And then polishing the tops. The bottoms of them weren't even polished. They were left with a saw mark. If anybody was to ever roll them over, you would see the marks of the, the saw blade. But it was really just to bring out that sort of interior, the real, if you like, the hidden beauty of that natural material. It is natural, but to bring out some of that beauty, you have to polish it, perhaps in the same way that water would do on a river, you know, a pebble on a, in a riverbed or the pebbles in, in the ocean. But this is just doing it quickly by hand and creating a surface that is functional and durable, but without entirely obliterating the original and natural beauty of the, the pieces of material, the pieces of granite. And then of course living and working with these people, uh, sorry, living in, not living, but spending seven days with, with uh, what was basically three families with their children. They're not from this part of China, but they travel there and work there for I think something like 11 months out of the year and then they go back to where they're from but they take the entire family with them and they live on the stone yard stone is their life for that for those 11 months and this is the this is the kitchen I'm part of the family now and I'm I'm dining with them this is the, the star dining room uh, this is the, the kind of the C CEO's uh, dining room, where, which I was invited for a private, you know, lunch with, which is kind of actually a fantastic experience, and, and a, again a really fundamental part of, of the whole project. They they are all exercises. They are all very important experiences, and and consuming the culture and and being a part of their culture, living with them for those for those days, um, builds up an amazing 
level of understanding without even being able to speak the language. And there's some really kind of beautiful, sensitive moments in their, uh, in their existence, I suppose. You know, that this is their food, and the, for the children, it's their, their, they are their pets. Um, and they make really beautiful little things for them, like marble or, gr <laughs> or, or, or granite feeding troughs. Um, you know, that is their natural, that is their predominant resource, that is their kind of vernacular, if you like. And there's the tea. And there's the exhibition. Uh, actually, this is after the exhibition in Beijing. We then kind of somewhat dystopianly <laughs> and uh, uh, ironically ship it to the UK and do a big show in London and, and try and sell it for lots of money, basically to cover the cost of producing it. Um, but quite powerful to see all of those boulders removed from the quarry, transformed very, very simply and subtly, uh, and then sort of almost thrown, seemingly thrown into the gallery space and just kind of let them speak for themselves. And these pieces all are in people's homes. And that table that I wanted to cut into four pieces, we actually only had to cut it into two pieces and then there was actually a natural split in the stone. So we, had, we took this very, very large wooden mallet, which actually is like one of my grandfather's tree logs on a stick and hit the boulder and it just split naturally. Uh, so that we, we got the four pieces, but by following the natural seam in the, in the stone. And then my last project, bringing us back to, to Italy. Uh, and a project that I developed in 2014 uh, for a company called Jack. Uh, Brent Jacorius, uh, an American, now living in London, founded this company uh, as, as, a, as a production company to work with designers. Currently, this is the, I'm the only designer that he has launched a product with, but I know that he's now currently in, in development with uh, Forma Fantasma, developing a new material completely removed from the one that I developed for him. But the company produces, their ambition is to produce material, uh, architectural surface materials. So raw materials that get put into or used for interiors and exteriors, floors and walls. And when he invited me to do this project, there was no precedent. There was no other, the company didn't really exist at that point. There was no other materials in his portfolio, so I could do pretty much whatever I wanted. But I had, because I'd done so much work with natural stone, I mean, I've now done uh, quarry projects in uh, Russia, Australia, Ireland, uh, upstate New York, Vermont, Switzerland, and elsewhere. Uh, and this, uh, China, China. Uh, and this, I, I sort of decided that I didn't want to just kind of take an existing stone material and, and convert it, but instead try and kind of create a new stone material from aggregates. And that's exactly what this is. So this uses an existing production factory in northern Italy, actually in just outside of Verona, uh, and immediately went there, spent some time with the factory, looked at the, the, the materials that they already produce and the aggr aggregates, the, the raw material that they use to produce them with, and basically started playing with them. It was a little bit like baking cookery, just kind of creating little compositions of these different uh, stones, and decided I wanted to make this all about Italy, uh, sort of, and chose the sort of iconic, maybe the iconic trio stones, the Tricolore, uh, I won't pronounce these right, but uh, uh, Rosso, Sant'Ambrogio, uh, Giallamori, and Verdi Alpi as the three main colorful aggregates, and then uh, Bianco Verona, or Bianconi, as the, as the background material. Uh, and the process quite simply involves taking different quantities of different colored aggregates that have been crushed into different sized particles. Verdi Alpi, Giallamori, you can see the Rosso Verona there on the, the back left hand side. That's the very 
that's the dust, the very small stuff which forms the background material, that's the next size up, um, and then to really big pieces. And the thing that I, I was very conscious about doing was making a new stone, a new stone material that had its own identity, its own kind of its own uh, presence, without disregarding its original format, without disregarding what it what it was until the point when I took it. And when I took it, when I picked it up, it was lumps of stone, and I wanted my new stone to be this kind of very stony version of itself. Uh, and the production um, uh, facility is is like a James Bond's kind of uh, Frank uh, Lair or kind of Baddies Empire uh, <laughs> conveyor belts uh, and these machines that you don't really know what they do. Uh, but the big yellow thing there is a big mixer, like a food mixer, and this thing here is the mold, like a cake tin. The mix. We cast a, a ten, 10 tons of material in one go, uh, pour it into the mould, and it uses uh, a polyester resin as the binding agent. It's a 5% polyester resin and 95% marble. Uh, the polyester resin it, uh, sets, sets and fixes the material all together. Uh, and I think it's something, I can't remember exactly if it's a week or two weeks uh, before the, the blocks of material are ready to be cut. And this is my very first impression when I visited this company and saw outside in their yard all the stacks of blocks of material and realized that they're, they're just blocks of colorful nothingness. You know, well, what is actually inside this material? A bit like those bowls of granite where you don't know really what's inside. But then you go into the showroom and you see all their samples and you realise that actually inside they're kind of stony nothingness. Uh, really what they're trying to do is mimic natural stone by taking 10 tonnes of Jalo Mori aggregate, compressing it into a mould and making a 10 tonne block of Jalo Mori, cutting into slices that look like a slice of Jalo Mori, like a slice of natural stone, when actually it's just a, a composition of, of aggregates. And so I feel like what what I did is a bit of is a bit of you know one of those materials that you either love or you hate. It's it's a very strong, visually strong material um, that looks like loads of stones thrown together, uh, and that really is what it is. But it was a very conscious, um, intentional device that I used in the formulating of that of that recipe, where every single piece of stone sits by itself. Uh, you can see every single piece of stone for what it is. And they are the sort of the, the, the trio, the three kings of, uh, well at least in my sort of naive British uh, perspective, the, 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 the three kings of Italian, of, of Italian marble. And that's the end of my lecture. I try something, I engage with it very, very intimately, 
and then I move on to the next thing. It's always there in the background, that knowledge, that experience, I've always got it. So it's like I'm constantly building up my knowledge of skills, of materials, of abilities. Uh, it's like I'm a student practicing to be a designer and learning the toolkit of you know, what it requires to be, a, to be a designer. Purpose, something which is very specific. Specificity. It's actually something that I learned when I, was, I did a lot of sport as a, as a child. I had no choice, my dad made me um, rugby. And I learned about training and how when you're training to do something, the, d training in a very specific sense is really important. There's no point learning to write, this is a really bad analogy, learning, learning to do things with your left hand if you're going to be right-handed. That's a terrible analogy. Um, I can't think of a good example. But it's about learning learning according to what you're trying to achieve and having a purpose is really important so that you, you have to kind of go even though you don't know what the outcome might be it's really important to have an intent and have a purpose um, and then obviously kind of the whole kind of process of, of applying these applying yourself to a given situation applying the techniques that you're learning applying the knowledge that you're that, you, that you're gaining um, and again the, the physical activity and then I love this last one, because I didn't realise that this actually applied, and that was uh, occupy the thoughts of war, worry or complex. There's actually an intellectual <laughs> process to this as well. It, it requires deep, kind of rigorous thought. Uh, but I think that goes back to the kind of doing everything with conscience, and doing, every, or doing everything with, with consciousness. Uh, doing everything with consciousness. I conclude.